everyone and welcome back to part two of La Bella Principessa, a Leonardo or a forensically infallible forgery. Hopefully you enjoyed the last upload and could hear it as I realised after uploading it was a little quiet. I think I've resolved those issues this time round and you'll be able to follow along with me a little easier in what will be a very historically dense second part. For any of you that may have forgotten, hi I'm RJ. Uh, I have tried to make this as easy to understand as possible but I can't guarantee I'll achieve it as some of these articles are very in depth. If you haven't listened to part one, I'll link it in the comments below. It's necessary to understand the rest of this episode and provides a lot of context to the artwork and why the art world has reacted the way it has to this work. For this episode, as I stated in the previous one, uh, I will struggle with the pronunciation of some of these academics and places as a lot of this episode ends up being based in Poland, a little hint for you there, but I will try my best. I have also realised after watching one of the documentaries related to the case that I pronounced most of the academics' names wrong the first time round, so I'll correct them this time. Now that I've got my apologies out of the way, let's move on to a quick recap of what we already know from part one. Head of a young girl in profile to the left, renamed as La Bella Principessa by Martin Kemp, is a supposed Leonardo portrait of a member of the Sforza court made during Leonardo's court period with the Sforza family in Milan. If this theory, put forward by most of the academics that are pro-Leonardo, such as Martin Kemp, Alessandro Vesossi, Carlo Progetti, and Cristina Giedo, not Ghetto like in the last part, is to be believed, the work would be worth several million dollars at a minimum and would have a high impact on Leonardo's over for his, this period and highlight a crucial link between France and Italy for the use of the choice crayon technique. However, not all academics are positive about the attribution, especially Christie's who originally sold the work and was sued by its previous owner Gianni Marchig for not knowing it was a potential Leonardo back in the 90s. In the previous video, I recreated La Bella Principessa in charcoal and pencil on paper, a much simpler mix of materials than what Leonardo originally used. For this episode's recreation, I took inspiration from La Bella Principessa's possible home, the Warsaw Sforzad. I will go into more detail about this work later, but La Bella Principessa, if from this book, would be classified as an illumination. So after doing a little bit of research, I have found an illuminator from Poland from this period named Stanislaw Samostrzelenski, and one of his works, The Hours of Bona Sforza, a critical figure to this story as a source of inspiration. So for this video, I will be brightening La Bella Principessa up a bit, placing her within a bright and colourful border depicted in coloured pencil to give an idea of what she would look like as part of a manuscript illumination if she had been created by Stanislaw, one of the top Renaissance painters of Poland, who was not only colourblind, but also terrified of unicorns, at least according to the Wikipedia article about him. As always, all my materials will be listed on screen and in the description below, along with all my research sources. As you may remember, our last episode split off in two timelines, the first covering the court case and this timeline, which will continue to unravel the academic research that has been conducted on La Bella Principessa over the last decade. So let's rewind to March 2010, when La Bella Principessa had just made her grand debut as a newly rediscovered potential Leonardo and academia went into meltdown. After the media and the academic world had rinsed La Bella Principessa for all the media attention it was worth, blasting Kemp and all the other academics from the previous episode for believing this work could possibly be a Leonardo, Kemp was emailed by Professor David R. Edward Wright from the University of South Florida, who had a theory for the portrait's origins that led Kemp and others into a decade-long rabbit hole of research and visits to Poland, of all places. This research rabbit hole gets quite confusing, so strap in everyone, it's going to get technical and full of academic shade. Professor Wright's original theory that he emailed to Kemp suggested that La Bella Principessa may have been excised, a fancy word for being very precisely cut out, of a presentation version of a book called the Sephorsiad, which is currently held in the National Library in Warsaw. This book was made as a presentation copy of the Sforzad, which was originally inspired by a book written by Giovanni Simonetta praising Francisco Sforza. Originally a mercenary company commander, or a condottore in Italian, Francesco swore allegiance to different powerful individuals, including his predecessor Filippo Maria Visconti, and became Duke of Milan in 1450 to restore peace after fighting broke out when his predecessor died without a male heir. 
However, the Holy Roman Emperor, Frederick III, was unwilling to legitimise his rule, so Francisco tried to advance his claim to the Duchy based on his marriage to a Visconti heir, Bianca Maria, his election by the people, his favour with his mother-in-law, the previous Duchess of Milan, and the recognition of his status by other monarchs and state heads. As part of his campaign, Simonetta's books were published highlighting Francisco's military and political capabilities to justify his position as Duke of Milan. Down the hereditary line, Ludovico Maria Sforza, Francisco's fourth son, also known as Ludovico El Moro due to his darker complexion, used a republished and edited version of the Sforzad to try and gain the duchy from his nephew Gian Gilazzo, after his father, Ludovico's older brother, had passed. Although Gian did become the Duke of Milan at the age of seven, with Ludovico acting as regent, Ludovico used the book and the Aristotelian theory of like father, like son of inherited political abilities to try and gain the throne, which is quite commonly used as justification to continue a family's monarchy or office. Whether the theory of inherited ability is true is hard to tell. As part of his power claim, Ludovico had 400 copies of the book about Francisco made at his own expense by Antonio Zorotti and even had it translated into Italian in later commissions to reach a wider audience to secure his power and notoriety. Through his campaign, Ludovico managed to secure power, becoming a de facto ruler of Milan in the 1480s and imprisoning Gian, who later died suspiciously at the age of 25. Now this is where we finally meet our presentation Sforzads. During the 1490s, Ludovico had four unique copies of the Italian Sforzad made into deluxe presentation books on vellum, with border illuminations slash decorations created by Gian Pietro Baraggio on the first page of the text. These decorations have been interpreted as being personalised for the intended recipients of the books to congratulate moments of dynastic significance. If interpreted correctly, three are for the births of a potential heir to the Duchy, and the fourth to a marriage in expectations of the potential heirs, because that's clearly the only reason people get married, right? So let's have a look at the intended destinations of the four works. This is largely all research based on the imagery and historical timelines of the family from rights research, but academics aren't 100% sure due to the multiple meanings of parts of the symbolism. So according to Wright, the one housed in Paris was made for Isabella di Aragona on the birth of her son Francisco, il Duceto, in December 1490 or January 1491. The dates conflict, depending on the source. With Duke Gian Galazzo, the nephew Ludovico imprisoned and potentially shock horror murdered for the douche. The London Sforzad may have been a presentation book for Ludovico's wife Beatrice de Esther on the birth of their son Maximilian on the 25th of January 1493. The Baraggio Sforzad fragments contained in the Uffizi in Florence celebrate the offspring of Gian Galazzo Sforza and Ludovico El Moro, who both became fathers within a week of one another in January of 1493. And finally, we come to the Warsaw Sforzad, which potentially celebrates the marriage of Ludovico's illegitimate daughter, Bianca Sforza, to Galeazzo Sansovino. The name Bianca may sound familiar to some, as A. Bianca Maria Sforza is who Vizossi, Petretti, and Giedo believed La Bella Principessa was depicting as a marriage betrothal picture to her future husband, Maximilian I. So I guess we can say they weren't far off. They had the right name-ish, by coincidence, just not the right woman. However, it is hard to know this for sure due to warring states and issues with the provenance of all four of these works. Between 1499 and 1500, the French invaded Milan and confiscated many books and valuable possessions from the Milan Duchy. The three books that ended up in Paris, London and Florence were taken from the Visconti Sforza Library at Pavia to Louis XII's Chateau at Blois, which is evidenced by a visitor's description from 1517. The Warsaw Sforzad, on the other hand, was taken by a military occupier in Milan until its supposed original owner, Galeazzo Sansovino, who had managed to switch sides after being released from prison and gained sympathy in the French court, sued and won recovery of his possessions in a French royal venue in 1518, bringing the Sforzad to Blois. The French invaded due to a long-standing claim to the Milanese Duchy, which I won't go into, but due to Ludovico's self-righteous and vain bragging about his legitimate access to the seat, this is most likely why the French invaded and took the books as a diplomatic tool to ridicule the Sforza family further. These books were then supposed to have been used as thank you presents to court grandees who had assisted in ousting Ludovico and Sansovino from Milan, which is where the murky provenance begins. 
The provenance for the British copy is okay, as it was donated to the British Library from the collection of Sir Thomas Grenville and can be traced back from him through auction catalogues. The Uffizi book was potentially gifted as a wedding present from King Francis I to Lorenzo di Medici, Duke of Urbino, for his loyalty and support of the French reconquest of Milan in 1515, before being destroyed during the Napoleonic invasion of Italy in 1796, where French soldiers looted books and manuscripts from the Sistine Chapel and the Vatican Library, excising illuminations to then be sold in lots at Christie's London in May of 1825. The Warsaw Sephora, on the other hand, is believed by many Polish academics to have come from the collection of Jan Zamoyski, 1542-1605, a 16th century Polish statesman and founder of the city of Zamosk, due to book stamps and an inscription linking the book to the noble family of the Zamoyski. This is all we will hear of Jan Zamoyski for now, from the initial research of Professor Ryan, but we have learnt a lot about the context of the book's creation and how it may have ended up in Poland, as well as how the three other books became dispersed across Europe, thanks to the French. <laughs> Although this theory and provenance research was not fully formed when Kemp received the email in 2010, he was interested in the initial idea of looking at the Warsaw Seforsad, even if it was just to rule it out, and contacted Silverman. From their discussions in December of 2010, Silverman went to Warsaw with David Murdoch and his film crew from National Geographic, who, as you may remember, were planning a documentary on the scientific study and its role in the authentication of La Bella Principessa. At the National Library in Warsaw, Silverman and his crew were given special access to the book and watched as one of the librarians flip through each of the pages individually, looking to see if any pages had been excised from the book, when, of course, the stub of a page is found where La Bella Principessa had obviously been excised. So we found out where she's from and that's it for the story, right? If only it was that simple. Silverman, overexcited about this new discovery, has Simon Hewitt, his journalist friend that he trusts, prepped to release the great news to the world. But Mr. Party Pooper Martin Kemp stops Silverman in his tracks, objecting to the release of any information until more research has been conducted to confirm that Silverman's snap judgment about the page stub was the true location of La Bella Principessa. Turns out Kemp was right to rain on Silverman's parade. As if La Bella Principessa had been on that page, it would have been in the middle of a text discussing the military and political conquests of the inspiration for the book, Francisco Sforza. This, realistically, from a bookmaking, storytelling and artistic standpoint, doesn't really fit. So Silverman calms down and Kemp and Cotte continue to research this new theory to see if there is any merit in Professor Wright's theory. On the 31st of January 2011, Cotte and Kemp, with the help of the National Geographic Expeditions Grant, negotiated with the National Library of Warsaw and got permission for Murdoch and his film crew to film them doing their research on the book at the library. The pair were helped by Polish scholar Katarzyna Wozniak, also referred to as Cassia, for translation as well as help with the history of the Polish Moors and the history of the Seforsad, and Tomasz Osolinski, an early printed book's bookkeeper. Their findings were detailed in 2012 when Kemp and Cotte published a secondary work entitled La Bella Principessa and the Warsaw Seforsad that was included in the revised Italian edition of their original book, highlighting the evidence that they think supports La Bella Principessa being part of the Warsaw Seforsad. Cotte's research of the book included a macro lens to combine photos digitally of the binding of the book to create a huge magnifiable image, a micrometer to measure the thickness of the vellum pages, and a spectrometer to record the composition of light that reflected from the surface of the vellum. To understand the composition of the Warsaw Seforsad better, Cott and Kemp compared it to the other two intact Seforsads held in London and Paris. From these versions, Kemp and Cott discovered that the book was bound in quires, where maybe four or five sheets of vellum were bound together to make a small book of 20 pages before being stitched together with more quires to make a larger book. These choirs consisted of four sheets of vellum, creating eight folios, or 16 pages, altogether. The Warsaw Seforsad, however, only had five folios in one of its choirs, meaning that three folios, or six pages, were missing. They also confirmed that all illuminations within these books face blank pages to avoid damage. From the macro lens image of the book's binding, Kemp and Cott found where the sheets were missing from, and where La Bella Princa may have been, which faced a blank page. This makes more sense than Silverman's suggestion, which would have faced written text. 
From the macro photography, which allowed Cott to look closely at the book binding, he believes that La Bella Principessa would have been on the sixth folio or the eleventh page of this choir, but Cott admits more research needs to be done. Kemp and Cott, to confirm their theory, had a facimile, basically an exact copy, of La Bella Principessa inserted into the work to check its placing, noting that it was a snug fit. As Cott notes, there are marginal size discrepancies as La Bella Principessa is two millimetres wider than all of the pages in the Sephorsad currently, which may be due to page edge cutting during rebinding or rebinding taking more of the page into the spine of the book. This becomes more apparent when compared to the Paris Sephorsad, which has irregular page widths, meaning that La Bella Principessa might have fit in the Warsaw Sephorsad pre-rebinding. The stitching of the rebinding also gave an explanation for the small holes on the edge of La Bella Principessa, which also matched up pretty well. Although the Sephorsad has five holes, whereas La Bella Principessa only had three, Kemp and Cott argue that this could be due to the way it was excised or other damage it experienced since leaving the Sephorsad, as well as the potential rebinding of the Sephorsad after La Bella Principessa's removal. Cott also emphasises that all of these issues do create margins for error, alongside the distinctly different preservations of both of these works, which may have affected the integrity of the vellum, and the use of measuring equipment that wasn't specific enough such as rulers. Overall, Cott concludes that he believes the margin of error would be only plus or minus 1.5 millimetres, which is still pretty close, but still enough to be wrong. There are further opportunities for error with the vellum, largely due to the preservation and materials used on the two works. Through comparison with the vellum from the Sephorsad and a 15th century sheet of vellum to act as a control, Cott uses a spectrometer to measure how light interacts with the vellum, to check the reflection of light and coloration. Cott made allowances for the gum arabic coating on La Bella Principessa, which has affected how it interacts with light by using some control vellum with gum arabic applied to see how much difference it makes to be able to make a better comparison. From this study, and from using a macrometer to measure the thickness of what Cott believes to be cast vellum in the two works, Cott believes that the La Bella Principessa's vellum measures similarly to the vellum in the first choir of the Sephorsad. Additionally, they discuss that the wooden panel that La Bella Principessa is secured to has two custom stamps, both in French. These stamps place the work in Paris before the 20th century, but whether it was there for a time or only imported temporarily is unclear. Alongside all of their scientific research, Kemp and Cott concluded their discussion with why they believe, from the research of Professor Wright, that Leonardo may have been the author of the work, and why they believe it may be Bianca Sforza. As to why it may be Leonardo, according to Kemp and Cott, Leonardo was known to have been closely involved with Galeazzo Sansovino, husband of the young bride. He designed Festa for the palace of Galeazzo, drew horses from the military commander's stables, and produced illustrations which were dedicated to Galeazzo. Kemp and Cott believe Leonardo was commanded to produce a portrait for the special book in a short time frame, so he researched a way of accomplishing a vivid image using a method that differed from traditional illumination, landing him with the choice crayons technique that he had sought advice on from Jean Perriel. From Professor Wright's research, they highlight that where they believe the portrait of La Bella Principessa sits in the Warsaw Sephorsad would immediately follow a printed letter of dedication to Ludovico by Francisco del Porza, who argues for the historical superiority of the written word, as exemplified in Simonetta's literary portrait of Francisco Sephorsa over any visual images that might aspire to perform the same purpose. They believe that based on what they know of Leonardo's character, he would have relished the challenge as he insisted that a discerning patron will be drawn more urgently to a painted portrait than any written text. Although Kemp and Cott, as stated in a documentary, felt quietly confident about all of these pieces of research lining up and potentially proving their attribution of Leonardo, not everyone was excited about the news. In Kemp's opinion, the senior staff at the National Library of Warsaw were reluctant to believe that Leonardo would have been in the Sephorsad. Kemp questions whether they may have been ashamed that the book wasn't in perfect condition and that the painting had been excised from a Polish national treasure, or that maybe they resented that other people outside of the library, or even outside of Poland, had discovered something new about the book. <laughs> Meanwhile, research was carried out by the Department of Chemistry at the University of Pavia, Italy, in 2011, to analyse the white lead pigment in La Bella Principessa using gamma ray spectroscopy to help date the pigment using the radioactive particles found within the lead. The research found that the lead had completed its decay, making it at least 244 years old. 
Furthermore, the Galleria Nationale in Urbino, Italy wanted it for an exhibition and conducted their own testing, confirming and extending Cotte's findings, highlighting these successive restorations. Both of these tests helped to corroborate Cotte's research as well as add more evidence to suggest that this can't be a modern fake unless it was created by the most well-researched or the luckiest forger of all time from the amount of scientific tests it would have to pass to be able to get to this point. To continue their study and to provide some interesting footage for the documentary, Kemp gets Sarah Simba, a professor and artist from the Ruskin School of Art at the University of Oxford, England, to recreate the work using traditional materials to see if the process was feasible to be filmed from the National Geographic documentary. Simblet researched the media used to create the work and created her own iron gall ink made from the oak apples left from wasp infestations. Yeah, I don't quite know what that means either. Uh, her own chalks from mineral pigments and used vellum from William Cowley, who provide vellum to the UK Parliament for law writing. I live in the UK and I had no idea we still did this. Uh, surely digital makes more sense, but hey, maybe it's also good to have a long-lasting hard copy. In January of 2012, Mystery of a Masterpiece and a print issue of the National Geographic article discussing the process was published. Many academics remain suspicious of its authenticity, arguing that not showing the work in a public gallery still makes the work seem more commercial. In October of 2012, Jeddo gave another lecture, entitled The Rationale for Authentication, highlighting her research journey with the work. Aside from backing Kemp and Cott's discussions, she rounds up her reasons against the common arguments made about the work. Firstly, she argues that there are two pieces of evidence that disprove the theory that it is a 19th century German pastiche of Renaissance works, because, firstly, the carbon-14 test dated the vellum between 1440 and 1650, marking the materials as being from the 15th century, matching the sitter's costume and the timeline of Leonardo. And secondly, the state of preservation and restoration of La Bella Principessa, which she argues can be seen by the naked eye and backed by the multispectral imaging results conducted by Cotte that highlighted the repaints and retouches. She also criticises the restorer for not adhering to the dry colour technique and using various different materials in their restoration of the work. In my opinion, although these points do not rule out a forger managing to find old white paint from four centuries beforehand, it seems unlikely that someone would go to this effort and not label or sell it as a Leonardo or a Renaissance work. Alternatively, it is not impossible that a 19th century pastiche would be restored by an inexperienced hand, but it seems weird to put effort into a restoration with no interest, as restoring artworks can become very expensive. Secondly, against the forgery allegations, Ghetto argues that although 20th century forgers have been incredibly cunning with their supports, materials and techniques, as my future episodes will discuss, she emphasises that the forger would have failed as the work always remained obscured and anonymous and has not yet been sold as a Leonardo if that was their aim. She also questions why would the forger use a technique and support not seen anywhere in Leonardo's oeuvre if their plan was to sell it as a real Leonardo. Thirdly, she discusses the possibility of it being a period copy of a lost Leonardo original, countering that the extreme sensitivity of the work is not characteristic of copies and there are numerous pentimenti or reworkings, as shown through Cott's multispectral imaging results, which would go against this idea. Gado believes this points to the work being an original portrait drawn from life. From this starting point, Jeddo then continues to argue why, if it was a 15th century court painter from the Milanese Sforza court, it was most likely Leonardo and not the two other portraitists, an unnamed artist known as Maestro della Palla Sforzesca, named after his most famous work, the Palla Sforzesca altarpiece, and Giovanni Ambrogio di Predes, who were both employed in Ludovica's court alongside Leonardo. Maestro, in Jeddo's opinion, was distressed by the arrival of Leonardo and combined the innovative style of Leonardo and the Lombard school of the Renaissance, creating a heavy and somewhat awkward result. De Predes, on the other hand, was a friend of Leonardo and an assistant for some of Leonardo's works, who Giedo argues is a more coherent and distinguished portraitist, but who was also influenced by the official rules. Although a great portraitist in his own right, according to Giedo, his depiction leaves a little to be desired in comparison with Leonardo's hand, as it lacks a spirit that makes Leonardo's portraits feel more emotive. The most obvious, aside from their portraiture style, however, is that none of the other court painters of this time were left-handed, aside from Leonardo, which can be seen in the hatches across the entire face of La Bella Principessa, similar to ones used in other drawings by the artist, such as the British Museum's study of a man in profile from the 1490s. 
Jeddo continues her lecture, hitting on many of the points covered in the last video, such as the colour zone, or headdress and style of dress of the woman, the anatomical features, particularly the eye, and the experimental material use, which all make the portrait feel more like Leonardo. For Jeddo, La Bella Principessa fits in the timeline of his work between La Bella Ferrione, the mistress of Ludovico il Moro, Lucrezia Crivelli, who also wears a Cazorne head covering, dated between 1495 and 1498, and the cartoon of Isabella di Esther, which the artist executed when he visited Mantua at the beginning of 1500s, after leaving Milan in the wake of its conquest by the French. I do recommend reading this lecture, as she has a lot of interesting theories or other pieces of evidence that I can't go into right now, such as Leonardo potentially being the inventor of wax crayons. But let's jump ahead two years to 2014 to hear more academic research and see where La Bella Principessa and Kemp end up next. In May of 2014, Kasia Wozniak, the Polish research assistant that helped Kemp and Cote with the translation and the history of the Polish collections, published her research on La Bella Principessa and the Warsaw Sforza, documenting its potential route and life in Poland until its final destination at the National Library of Poland. The main theory, presented by Polish scholars, is specifically Professors Horodowski, a Polish historian, and Karweka Grykalza, a renowned specialist in Polish bibliography, believe that the Sforza had made its way into Poland through Queen Bonus Sforza of Poland and Sigismund I the Elder, as a wedding present in 1518, which was passed on to the library of her son, Sigismund II Augustus, and subsequently was included in Jan Zamoyski's book collection. Over two centuries later, it became part of the library of the estate of Zamosk and finally entered the National Library in Warsaw. However, this theory is based on a lot of circumstantial evidence, and no opposing theory has ever been produced. Professor Wright argues that the Sephorsa could not have initially come with Bona Sephorsa, the third child of Gian Galazzo Sephorsa, the nephew Ludovico, may be murdered to secure his role as Duke, as the introduction to the work strongly emphasises Ludovico, her great uncle. Wright also argues that aside from the subject matter, the timeline of the first French invasion of Milan, which dethroned Ludovico, as well as a secondary French invasion, which ousted his eldest son Maximilian I, happened a few years before Bonner's wedding, most likely meaning that the book would have been seized by the French. In this instance, it was most likely used as a wedding gift from the King of France for Bonner and Sigismund III's wedding, as a taunting reminder that the King of France was the only one able to restore her family to power in Milan. Apparently, the King of France may have kept his promise, as in November of 1521, he put the second son of Ludovico, Francesco, on the throne, who had been raised in France and was much more popular than his older brother, Maximilian. Wozniak notes, however, that to undertake and prove these theories, an extensive research investigation would need to be undertaken on all of the Sephorsad copies with archive access across Europe, which at this point in 2014 had not been done. At this point, academics have been unsuccessful in confirming the hypothesis that the book was bequeathed to her only son, Sigismund II Augustus. Although he was the last heir of their dynasty, the Jagolianens in Poland, and was an avid book collector renowned for collecting rare and precious artefacts, which totaled over 4,000 volumes, he is not mentioned in the discussions of Horodowski on the Sforza's possible provenance. Bosniak, however, follows this theory, showing the potential timeline of the book if it had been passed down the Jagolian dynasty to Sigismund II. From what we know, in 1547, the library was moved to the royal castle in Vilnius, Lithuania, where the Jagolian and family were Grand Dukes at the time. However, there is no catalogue from this period that has survived to prove it was definitely there. However, if it was, in 1565, the collection was moved to Tykosin, the king's private estate on the territory of today's Poland, but there are questions on whether the collection was split with volumes taken to Warsaw Castle. The Warsaw Castle collection was most likely looted during the Swedish deluge of the 1650s. However, the surviving catalogue from the Royal Library of Stockholm does not mention the Sephorsad, meaning it must have remained in Poland at this point, either in a Tycon collection or elsewhere. On the 7th of July 1572, Sigismund died, leaving precise instructions in his will for all his books, no matter where they may be, to be given to the Jesuit College of Vilnius, Lithuania, which had been newly set up in the city. However, due to political issues within Poland and Lithuania after his death, this didn't quite happen. The current inheritors of that collection, the Library of Vilnius University, holds only 14 volumes, the rest either stolen or dispersed. Unfortunately, it is also known that his sister Anna was not the best executor of his will and did not go out of her way to fulfil his wishes. 
Anna Jagelionka is known to have given many books to courtiers, churches and secular institutions, as well as to several individuals, including Chancellor Jan Zamoyski. The library of the Zamoyski estate holds the largest surviving part of the royal book collection, owning 164 works in 106 volumes. It remains unclear in what circumstances or when exactly he came into possession of the Sephorsad, and equally uncertain why the Warsaw Sephorsad is the only book without the characteristic royal cover of purple velvet among the 94 volumes from the original collection. Jan himself was a doctor of law, rector of the University of Padua, an avid book collector and author, as well as a royal archivist, which earned him much renown. It has been suggested that this work is how he gained some of his royal documents, as there is evidence from a royal letter asking Jan to return several important documents that suggests he had been using them for self-study. However, it is also possible that he was gifted them by Anna Jagolionka after her brother's death. Wozniak argues that the donation is much more likely, as Jan collecting works from the royal collection at Tykosin to try and preserve them would probably have led to a larger collection, as 106 surviving volumes of the possible 4,000 is a very small portion. In 1605, Jan died, leaving the books of the university he created, the Zamoyski Academy in Zamosk, the city he founded. However, it is likely that some of his collection remained in an unproven but possible private castle collection for his successors. Although researchers have not been able to find any catalogue proof for sure, there were many books that were re-included in the Academy's library in 1675 due to a ten-year dispute following the death of the third inheritor of Zamoyski's estate, Jan, nicknamed Sorbipan, as he died heirless in 1665. However, the Sephorsad holds a Latin inscription that although it has been purposely destroyed at some point, three reconstruction shows that the Sephorsad may have been in the collection before 1675 ahead of the estate disputes. In 1668, the collection was reorganised, leading to the beginning of a new cataloguing of the library. Finally, we may get a catalogue with Sephorsad involved. However, in 1674, the city of Zamosk was inherited again, and a considerable amount of the Zamoyski estate is noticeably lost, which may have been the initial reason for cataloguing everything. In 1675, a professor at the university finished cataloguing the library's 4,000 works in the first known catalogue, where finally the Sephorsad appears. Unfortunately, the Academy experienced a decline and lack of interest from Jan's family line, leading to a drop in funding and teaching standards at the Academy. For 90 years, there was not another mention of the Sephorsad in the collection or in any catalogues. After being revitalised by the Vatican in the mid-1700s, a new catalogue was created toward the end of 1760. However, many notes made on this archive by Jan Kuchanowski, a 20th century historian, have been destroyed due to World War II. In 1772, Austria, ruled by the Habsburgs, took over parts of Poland alongside Prussia and seized all of the assets that gave finance to the academy. However, in 1776, we do have a catalogue entry for the Sephorsad from Adrian Krabowski, so although unsure if it was always there for the full century, we know it was in 1776. The academy continued in its decline, largely due to the Austrian invaders, which drained the city of Zamosk, leading to the academy closing in September of 1784. The Royal High School inherited the collection, which may have been damaged or lost due to differences between a 1783 catalogue of the Academy collection and the 1800 Royal High School library collection, which have never been researched. However, the collection's luck changed when Stanislaw Kostka Zamoyski inherited the estate and obtained the book collection from the Academy to be hopefully put into a permanent library in Zamosk. Unfortunately, the catalogue from this period is not very good and hated by many authors as it is almost impossible to use or even find the most important items. Unsurprisingly, the Sephorsad does not exist on this list, whether it is due to the oversimplification of the catalogue's listing or the fact that it was not in the collection is, however, unknown and may have been in the private possession of the Zamosk family once again. The reason for this recataloguing and reorganisation can be linked to the potential joining of the collection with the Ossolinski collection from Vienna, which held almost 30,000 volumes, which its Polish collector wanted to bring back and establish in Poland, originally in Warsaw, before deciding on Zamosk. Unfortunately, due to a conquest made on the fortress of Zamosk in 1809, it was deemed unsafe to hold this precious collection in an area that was politically unstable, as during the surrender, two carts of books were taken from the estate's library. In 1810, Stanislaw and his family moved to Warsaw, where the collection was finally, carefully catalogued and organised into the library of the estate of Zamosk, held in their Warsaw home of the Blue Palace until 1814. Although this aforesaid contains a symbolic book plate from 1815, when the Duchy of Warsaw was restored, like many other books from the collection, 
this could have been added later, as was common practice, as many of the books from this period were systematically renovated and rebound in the family's own lithographic studio and book bindery. In 1819, a separate building close to the Blue Palace was built to store the huge collection. The collection again was almost lost in 1830 during the Polish November Uprising, which saw Stanislaw flee to Russia and then Vienna, leaving the collection in the charge of his son. In 1836, a librarian catalogues the collection, which also includes the Sephorsad. The collection was moved again in 1868 to a newly designed building for the ever-growing collection, opening the library out to the general public with precious manuscripts stored in the treasury and becoming a leading 19th century Polish institution. And then, again, World War II causes issues, as all of the archiving from this period was destroyed by invading forces, as well as thousands of important manuscripts and documents. Although some things, such as the Sephorsad, were luckily saved by the brave librarians, many others were destroyed or borrowed by German forces. In 1944, the Warsaw Uprising began, and thankfully the last heir of the mosque received permission to leave the city, taking the entire royal collection with him, before donating them back in 1946 to the National Library of Warsaw, which concluded the Sephorsad, where it has been ever since. So now let's do a very quick run through of this potential timeline in much less detail. So Ludovico is in charge in Milan and has the book. The French invade, they oust him and potentially at this point take the book. Maximilian I then takes over as Duchy of Milan and may still have the book at this point, but then the French invade again and then may take the book at this point instead. If the French have the book, uh, it may have been given as a petty wedding present to Bonisaforsa to get her allegiance to them. From Bonus of Forces care is passed on to her son Sigismund II Augustus, who is a big time book collector. If the book is in his collection in 1547, that collection is moved to Vilnius, uh, Lithuania. In 1565, the collection is moved back to Poland to Tykosin. In 1573, Sigismund dies, uh, and the collection should go to the Jesuit Academy in Vilnius, but his sister Anna does not go through with this. From this point on, it is either given by Anna or taken for the personal research by Jan Zamoyski. In 1605, Jan dies and the whole collection is to be given to the Zamoysk Academy in Zamosk. The family again, however, doesn't follow the last will and testimony and it possibly stays in their private collection. In 1665, the third Zamoyski heir dies heirless and the whole collection is finally given to the Academy after a 10 year debate. In 1675, we have the first appearance of the Sephorsad in the Zamoyski Academy collection catalogue, which is amazing. The Academy then goes into decline, gets revitalised by the Vatican, which doesn't really work, but a new catalogue is created in 1760. However, most 20th century notes on this archive were destroyed in World War II. In 1772, Austria invades, seizes all assets from the Academy, and the Academy goes further downhill. In 1776, a catalogue mentions the Sephorsa, but no idea if there, it was there the entire 100 years. In 1784, the academy closes and the Royal High School inherits the collection. In the early 1800s, Stanislaw Zamoyski inherits the Zamosk estate, takes back the book collection to create a library. There's a very bad catalogue of collections made due to the possible ossolinsky zamoyski collection joining, but you can't find anything on it, including the Sephorsa. In 1809, the mosque is invaded and the collection joining is put off. In 1810, Stanislaw and family move to Warsaw and the library of the estate of the mosque is created and catalogued, held in the Blue Palace until 1815. The Sephorsad shows a book plate from this period to commemorate the Duchy of the Warsaw being reinstated, but we have no idea if it's from 1815 or added later in, during rebinding. In 1819, a new building for the library is built and the collection is moved. In 1830, the Polish November Uprising begins and Stanislaw flees, but the collection remains and is kept safe in its new building by his son. In 1836, a catalogue is made with the Sephorsad catalogue. So in 1868, a new library building is built and then we don't really hear any too much more on the collection until World War II, because obviously World War II destroys Poland, the Warsaw Library building is destroyed, parts of the collection are destroyed, you know, typical Nazi stuff. But the Sephorsad survives in the basement thanks to librarians. Uh, and then in 1944, the Warsaw Uprising occurs. The last Zamosk heir flees and takes the royal collection with him, but then brings it back in 1946 and donates it to the National Library of Warsaw, where the Sephorsad has remained ever since. 
So as we can see, there is a lot of missing undocumented time for the history of the Sephorsad, meaning there is a huge amount of time for the Labella Principessa to have been excised. Was it by a family member, by a librarian, by a treasure hunter or artifact enthusiast in the 18th century when manuscripts and important books became fashionable, collectible and worth a lot of money? Or was it taken more recently by the Nazis? Who knows? We may never know, but if anything, we at least have a sporadic timeline for where the book may have been from Wozniak's research of the catalogues and can narrow down some of La Bella Princess's possible contacts. <laughs> Meanwhile, Scripta Manet, the luxury book publishers of Leonardo Infinito by Vizossi and Pedretti, created a fasimal of the Warsaw Sephorsad for its fine book collectors, notably with the fasimal of La Bella Principessa, aka Bianca Sephorsa, bound in its supposed place. Unsurprisingly, the National Library of Warsaw refused this, so Kemp suggested presenting the portrait inside a copy based on the British Library Sephorsad, which had its original outside binding, unlike the Warsaw copy that had been rebound to fit within the Zamoyski collection. Apparently this is available to buy from fascimalfinder.com for $7,000 new or cheaper pre-owned. In December 2014, a concerted effort was made by all of the pro-Leonardo scholars to create a beautiful exhibition at the Galleria Nationale della Marcia, presenting the research and history of the Warsaw Sephorsad alongside the fascimal made by Scripta Manat, with a live model playing the role of Bianca. In 2015, the same fascimal was shown in an exhibition in Monza during Expo Milan, alongside a catalogue with contributions by Cristina Giedo, Mina Gagori and Elisabetta Gnerga, a costume historian who confirmed that the Milanese court dress, headpiece, hairstyle and design are accurate for the period. Gnerga's research was published in a Scripta Manat book, also, and as expected, was a limited run and very expensive, so shockingly, I have no access to it. In May of 2015, Wozniak again published more research, this time focusing on the possible excision of La Bella Principessa from the Warsaw Sephorsad. After recounting her findings from her previous research, Wozniak focuses her attention on the relationship between Stanislaw Samoski, Joseph Ossolinsky, and the Zartorsky family, as these three important bibliophiles and cultural collectors came together in the 18th century to help preserve the cultural history of Poland during a period of political turmoil. Wozniak believes that the Sartorsky family are largely ignored for their role within the Sephorsad's journey in Poland in most of the research that has been conducted so far. For Wozniak, these three contributors became critical during the third and final partition of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth in 1795, which created a surge of interest in collecting and preserving cultural and historical artefacts for future generations, with the most prolific art collector of this period and in Polish history being Countess Isabella Kartowska. The House of Kartowski was a noble Polish family of Lithuania, who held the most power during the 18th century period that we are discussing. Isabella herself founded one of the most prominent museums in Poland, the Kartowski Museum in Krakow, and her family has a long history of collecting artworks, and her son, Prince Adam Jerzy Kartowski, has a Leonardo link as he purchased Lady with an Ermine, which arrived in the Kartowski Palace in Polowie around 1800s. Although how he came to own the work and where it was before is unknown, the painting remained there for 30 years until the November Uprising in 1830. Although this is one Italian Renaissance link with the family, a more direct link between Polish and Italian Renaissance history is via Queen Bona Sforza, who was, we discussed earlier, daughter of Duke of Milan Gian Galazzo Sforza and wife of Sigismund I, King of Poland. At the time that the three bibliophile families were collecting and maintaining the cultural history of Poland, Bono was one of the most prominent figures of Polish history and of interest to all three families. From this interest, Wozniak argues that all three of these families must have been aware of the Sforzad and that potentially, if La Bella Principessa was still inside the Sforzad, there may have been discussions of Bono Sforza as the sitter and reason for the Sforzad's residency in Poland. This is compounded by the fact that the Sephorsa ended up in the Zamoyski collection through the Jagolian family line, as discussed previously. Furthermore, the iconography painted in other illuminations within the Sephorsad, linking the book to the history of Francesco Sephorsa, a famed patron of Leonardo, means that Wozniak believes the Zamoyskis and Kartowskis may have concluded that La Bella Principessa was by Leonardo. Regarding a reason why La Bella Principessa may have been excised from a record discussing the highlights of Isabella's collection, there are mentions of several female Leonardo 
Leonardo portraits. Aside from discussing some of these works as gifts, as presenting the Countess with a new find was always a good idea, the mention of women of Leonardo could mean a few things. Firstly, we know that her son purchased Lady with an ermine, so it is possible that this is one of the women. However, other portraits by Leonardo could also include the excised portrait of La Bella Principessa, something that was common within her collection as the catalogue of the Gothic house lists several excised pages from different manuscripts. Unfortunately, Wozniak can't be sure, as the November Uprising in 1830 has caused issues with the ability to reconstruct the palace collection of Pulloway, as war tends to do. Due to this war, and the Warsaw Uprising in World War II, which disturbed the Zamoyski collection, it is hard to know the exact movements of the Sephorsad, let alone La Bella Principessa as a separate entity. Alongside this, it is also possible that La Bella Principessa may have been housed in private areas of the palace and was not officially listed as part of any collections in the catalogues anyway. Alongside this, the framing of the portrait does not provide us with any help, as of yet, as we do not know when the portrait was attached to the oak panel or when the frame was added. Wozniak emphasises that research on the frame and materials could be helpful in narrowing down a time frame of knowing when the La Bella Principessa was out of the Sephorsad at a minimum, although not providing a direct answer for when it was excised. Her perception of the frame from the few photographs available leans towards the idea that the frame decorator knew the work was from an illuminated manuscript, as it is decorated in a similar style, but the bad quality of the photographs makes it difficult to make any precise identifications of imagery and symbols. This is also going to be difficult seeing as Christie's lost the frame originally after they took it off when they went to sell it in the 90s, so we do not have the frame any longer and only have those photos as evidence, so this inquiry would end up being quite difficult but I think that there are definitely ways that it could be done if the photographs can be enhanced in any way at least. So although Wozniak's research draws no new concrete evidence for La Bella Principessa and the Sephorsad, it does discuss the possibility that La Bella Principessa may have been known as a Leonardo in the 18th century by the Zamoyski and Sartoski families and may even have been excised for Isabella Sartoski and noted as one of her women by Leonardo. Even if none of this is true, Wozniak has given us some points to consider and provided historical context to the political situation in Poland, and why it may be difficult to know the true reason for La Bella Principessa's excision from the Sephorsad and its potential life in Poland if it was in the Sephorsad to begin with. In June 2015, the first batch of research against all of the attributions made by Kemp, the Leonardo attribution, as well as the Warsaw Sephorsad as the home for La Bella Principessa, is brought forward by Katarina Kryzagorska Pisarek, further known as Pisarek, who publishes her first arguments against the attribution. Before I discuss who Pisarek is within the situation, I will discuss her research before letting the biases of other academics cloud the research discussions. To introduce her research, Pisarek discusses the journey of La Bella Principessa so far, highlighting that Gans, its first known buyer, believed it was a pastiche and that, as I mentioned previously, she made no profit from its sale to Silverman. Her view of Gans in comparison to Silverman seems more positive, as she discusses the way that Silverman presented himself to Antiques Trade Gazette, labelling himself as a buyer on behalf of a independently wealthy collector interested in charitable causes and animal issues, which to Pisarek sounds similar to Gianni Marchig, with Silverman adding his employer is interested in setting up a non-profit making foundation for multidisciplinary classical and renaissance studies near Florence to be headed by Professor Martin Kemp, which understandably sounds incredibly fishy on Silverman and Kemp's part. For Silverman, this makes it sound like he has no interest in this attribution aside from some form of commission by his interested collector, I would presume, which is notably smaller than whatever money he would get from the sale of the La Bella Principessa if solidly attributed as a Leonardo, which is in his sole possession. For Kemp, the possible foundation set up under him would be a considerable change in comparison with being a lecturer at Oxford. Whether the new job has more notoriety is undeterminable, but I would presume that the responsibility of being in charge of a new Renaissance institution would be well benefited, as well as it being close to the world of the Renaissance and all of its primary source material than Oxford. Although this is an issue for Pissarek, the main bulk of her article argues that the researchers trying to prove that La Bella Principessa is a Leonardo have ignored or have not fully researched information and leads that could prove it is not a Leonardo, which she believes goes against the ideas of 21st century connoisseurship. She, however, does not place this research responsibility solely on the group that are pro-Leonardo, but for the individuals that have spoken publicly to the media of their intuition or first impressions of the work, but who Pisarek argues have not done more to systematically discuss their reasons or provide any research against that attribution. To start, she discusses the opinion of Pietro Morani, head of Raccolta Vinciana, who stated in 2008 when showing the work by Silverman that he believed it to be a copy with not enough evidence for a Leonardo attribution. 
Although he acknowledges that lack of provenance brought up by other doubters isn't an issue for Leonardo as his records are notably sparse, in his article from 2012 he emphasised that it was heavily restored from a later period and technically unusual for Leonardo, but that the left-handed hatching underneath is from a better portraitist, like Leonardo, or has been imitated by one of Leonardo's students to make sellable copies of the original. However, the rigid profile of the sitter and the highly finished attention to detail in her dress contrasts with his other portraits of the period and their flexible postures and design. Like the portrait of Isabella de Este, he also argues that the idea of it being made for the Sephorsad or as a miniature for a book does not nullify these technical differences. Pistolek also adds that she questions a book designed and illuminated by Biragio having a potential Leonardo inside. In his conclusion, Morani proposes Giovanni Ambrogio de Prades, who Jedo discusses earlier, as a potential artist for this work due to his close ties to Leonardo and his ability to imitate Leonardo's style. Another critical article from this time that Pissarek highlights is the review for Kemp and Cote's first book from David Escajan, who argues that he believes the work to be, to be a pastiche due to similarities between medallion portraits, a specific polychrome bust of a woman by Francisco Loranen in the Kunsthistorische Museum in Vienna, and other sculptural material from the Renaissance era which he believes the creator has used to cover their tracks in making the pastiche. Aside from his perspective, Eskajan also takes issues with the lack of thoroughness and rigour in the attribution evidence and the almost total absence of close comparisons with unimpeachable works by Leonardo. Pissarek now begins discussing her own research, starting with the provenance for the work. As you will remember from the last video, the earliest known provenance for the painting by itself comes from the late Giannino Marchig in the early 20th century on the good faith word of his wife Jeannie Marchig. Just like in Giannino's records, there is no mention of the provenance for the work in the records of Leonardo or in sales and inventories anywhere. There are a few references to portrait heads done by Leonardo, but no busts like La Bella Principessa. Whether one of these descriptions is for La Bella Principessa or not is also hard to know. Giannino himself, as a restorer of Leonardo's, was familiar with his technique, and as Pissarek notes, exhibited in the 1920s in Warsaw. So if the theory of La Bella Principessa's provenance in Poland is to be believed, in the Sephorsad or as a separate entity, Marchig may have come across La Bella Principessa at this time. Marchig also became good friends with Bernard Berenson, one of the most renowned Renaissance art historians of the 20th century, and through him had contact to curators, historians, artists and critics from around the world, who Marchig worked for at different times as a restorer, as documented through photographs in his collection. Critically though, Pissarek argues that if Marchig did have La Bella Principessa at this time, why did he firstly never show it to any of them to ask their opinion of it? Or why did none of these infamous art historians and curators ever see the work in his collection, leaving Pissarek to insinuate, seeing as Marchig was known as a Leonardo-esque painter, that he may be the creator of La Bella Principessa. Her second avenue of research discusses the identity of the sitter. From the few possibilities from the Sephorsa court, Beatrice de Esther, Isabella of Aragon, Bianca Maria Sephorsa, Anna Sephorsa, or Bianca Sephorsa, she follows the pro-Leonardo attributors, Theory of Bianca Sephorsa. Bianca was born in 1482 and died in 1496, aged only 14. On the 31st of December 1489, she was married to a distant relative of her father's, the Milanese military commander Galeazzo di Sansovino. Unlike most of the other possible women, there are no securely identified likeness portraits for Bianca, aside from the proposed portrait of a young woman by Giovanni Antonio Baltrofio and arguably La Bella Principessa. However, they both look very different from each other. Art historian Julia Marie Cartwright has also suggested portrait of a lady by Ambrogio di Prides from 1490 as a portrait of Bianca, which looks similar to Baltrofio's, but not to La Bella Principessa, as her nose and light eye colour differ. Kemp, in comparison, has suggested that the Ambrogio portrait may be of Anna Sephorsa, who has no secured likeness portraits either, but he does not provide any evidence as to why it is Anna and not Bianca. From evidence of Ambrosio de Prides' confirmed portraits of Beatrice de Esther and Bianca Maria Sephorsa, Pissarek has suggested that Ambrosio can be relied on to create a true likeness in his portraits, as his portraits of each woman have similar features to other known portraits of the women. This strikes Pissarek as odd, however, when it comes to La Belle Principessa, as at first she was thought to be Bianca Maria Sephorsa, wife of Emperor Maximilian, by Vizosi Padretti and Turner, but La Bella Principessa has a very different profile from Bianca Maria's confirmed profile. Pissarek also presents Cartwright's reasoning that she believes the Ambrosio portrait to be of Bianca Sephorsa, as it has a paired painting with it of a man, presumed to be the husband of the bride, Galeazzo di Sansovino, which is completed with similar materials and of a similar manner and size. 
If Kemp was correct in his assumption of this woman to be Anna, then the painting would most logically be of her husband Alfonso I de Esta, who we have a likeness of, and who does not look anything like Galeazzo di Sansovino. Pissoric, in her third avenue of research, discusses La Bella Principessa's possible location in the Warsaw Seforsad. Her first question lies in the way that La Bella Principessa may have been removed from the Seforsad during a rebinding, as Kemp and Cott have suggested, as the knife has slipped on the left side due to a quick and forceful movement, something not likely to be necessary during a rebinding, especially for an important collection like the Zamoyski Library. Her second question lies in the difference of opinion between Professor Horodowski and with Wozniak and Wright's newer research. To begin with, the number of folios Horodowski counts in the Seforsad back in 1944 is the same as what we find now, according to her, proving that no pages have been removed since his research on the book. This is where the similarities end, unfortunately, as Wright and Horodowski disagree on the purpose of the London Seforsad. Wright believes it was to commemorate the birth of Beatrice de Esther's first son, but Horodowski makes no mention of Beatrice de Esther or any iconography linking her to the Seforsad or the child in the frontispiece of illuminations. Pissarek suggests that maybe the Seforsad was for the wedding of Beatrice rather than for Maximilian's birth, as a compromise between the two theories. Similarly, with the Paris Seforsad, which Wright suggests was to commemorate the birth of Gian Galazzo Seforsad's first son Francesco in 1491, Horodowski argues that Gian had no legitimate children at the time of the illumination of the book in 1490 and was more likely a wedding gift from Ludovico to Gian Galazzo. The Warsaw's aforesaid has the most issues, as Horodowski believes that the work was destined for one of the children of Gian Galazzo, not for Galeazzo Sansovino at all which would mean there is no reason for the portrait to be in the Seforsad if it is of his prospective wife, Bianca Seforsa. Both identify the iconography within the illuminated frontispiece very differently, with Wright highlighting iconography that matches a multitude of different individuals from the Seforsa family, which highlights a plethora of different recipients. Pissarek also emphasises issues with the Seforsad timeline in comparison to the life of Bianca Seforsa, as when the Seforsad was likely created, alongside the other copies between 1489 and 91, Bianca would have been between 7 and 9 years old, and not old enough to look like the portrait of La Bella Principessa. In Pissarek's first visit to research the Warsaw Seforsad in 2012, she discusses some key findings. 1. That none of the other Seforsads have illuminations by anyone other than Baraggio, which are all similar in style and technique. 2. That Leonardo never worked as a miniaturist or with these materials, which she thinks would have been documented by someone, somewhere, for how rare it is. 3. That these materials are completely unsuitable for the manuscript, as they will transfer and doesn't match the illumination style that Baraggio has set for the rest of the book, such as matching colours. 4. That where she placed La Bella Principessa within the book would be opposite a written page, which is not how it is done in any of the other Seforsads, alongside the fact that the text has nothing to do with Bianca Seforsa. Pissarek later continues that the layout of the folios also follow a pattern across the three Seforsads we have, and believes that where Kemp suggested the illumination would be placed would replace a page that is blank in the Paris and London Seforsads. 5. That from her research, the vellum of La Bella Principessa looks more yellowed, leathery, and harsher than the finer vellum used in the Seforsad, which in her opinion looks more like paper. Although she concedes that the gum arabic and different preservation styles between the Seforsad and La Bella Principessa may have had an effect, she believes that the leathery texture of the work is still not accounted for from Kemp and Cott's research. The idea of La Bella Principessa also being on the wrong, previously fur-covered side of the vellum doesn't match the preparation styles of the vellum in the Seforsage, which doesn't have a rougher side due to the way it was prepped, and that Baraggio's illuminations are done on the better side, which again makes La Bella Principessa stand out as an oddity. 6. That La Bella Principessa is smaller than the Seforsage pages, which have been trimmed. La Bella Principessa has uneven sides, which would most likely mean that it was removed before the Seforsad was trimmed, meaning that it being smaller than the trimmed edges more likely suggests it was not there in the first place. And 7. That the stitching holes in the Seforsad and the stitch holes in La Bella Principessa don't match in spacing and position on the page. After all of these arguments, which drive Pissarek to conclude that the artwork is not from the Seforsad, she turns to La Bella Principessa alone, discussing the possibility of it being by Leonardo and its potential creation date. Although there is evidence of Leonardo using chalk in other works and his influence in the work of his pupils, these works use chalk in a different way, creating a more prominent Sofmato effect and were largely in unfinished looking drawings. Pissarek also believes that the timeline that Kemp and Cott state for Jean Pariel and Leonardo's meeting in 1494 doesn't make much sense for the evidence she has gathered, placing a more likely meeting of 1499 for their meeting, which would be too late for the drawing style of La Bella Principessa. Aside from the materials, the anatomical details on the work for Pissarek seem off, 
due to the work being a potentially overworked pastiche of Leonardo's other works. The structure also feels too hard and formal in comparison with his other portraits, which have softer contours and textures from the sumato technique. When it comes to decorations within the work, such as the Leonardo-esque knots on the sitter's dress, which Jeddo believes looks similar to knots Leonardo designed for a mysterious institution that he potentially founded, known as the Academia Leonardi Vinci, Pissaric argues that these knots were possibly very common within the Milanese style of the time. To her knowledge, the knots look similar to knot designs present within the portrait by Ambrogio de Predes of Bianca Maria Sforza, as well as in the ceiling of a hall in the Castello of Milan and other buildings, suggesting that these knot styles may have been very fashionable and become common property amongst artists of this time, even if Leonardo may have been the originator of the knot style. It is also different enough from the knots confirmed to be by Leonardo to give Pissarek doubt that they are an original Leonardo. From all of these various pieces of evidence, Pissarek argues that not only was La Bella Principessa not taken from the Warsaw Sforzad, but that it is most likely a skillful pastiche of a bunch of other Leonardo works, as well as a few other Renaissance works, rather than a Leonardo original, and that it is most likely not a portrait of Ludovico's illegitimate daughter, Bianca Sforza. From Kemp's perspective, he didn't understand why Pissarek was interested in his research and was unaware of who she was. As she is not a Leonardo scholar, Kemp believed that maybe her research was based on some form of Polish solidarity with the other scholars that were anti-Leonardo. However, Kemp soon realised that Pissarek was fairly high up in the UK branch of the international campaign group Artwatch International, which campaigns for better practices in the conservation of artworks around the world. This group will feature more prominently a little later. Alongside this, Pissarek has also spent the majority of her career researching the conservation and attribution practices of different institutions and connoisseurs within Europe, specialising in the works of Rubens and J.M.W. Turner. This bias, however, causes a tension between both academics, as we shall soon see, and in my opinion, doesn't really help the case for the attribution. <laughs> In November 2015, media attention continues to grow as different articles are published about the new research with the Sforzad, and the continued debate of La Bella Principessa's authenticity is rehashed. The arguments seem to become very territorial in Kemp's opinion, with the group surrounding Silverman being pro-Leonardo, whereas the dealers, auctioneers and museum curators in New York continue to be anti-Leonardo with the addition of Polish scholars concerned for the intellectual integrity of the Sforzad. For Kemp, he finds some of these criticisms unfounded, as highlighted in this statement. It is common for critics of the attribution either to make no reference to the evidence of the technical examinations or to assert that the science is without value in reaching a judgment. Science is unlikely in most cases to prove an attribution, but it can decisively narrow down it and in some instances eliminate possibilities. We have scientific evidence that acts decisively against any of the forgery claims. Realistically, it would be very hard to continue to argue that La Bella Principessa is a forgery after several different individual institutions have done testing on the work and made dating on the leads, pigments and vellum, which places the materials in the time period of Leonardo and makes it being a modern forgery unlikely. On the other hand, dismissing scientific testing is not new in the art world, although usually in the opposite direction, with owners dismissing scientific testings that may potentially indicate inconsistencies in what they believe to be an original work. The art world, however, when it comes to authentication and connoisseurship has been largely based for centuries on the abilities of an individual's knowledge of an artist, and being able to prove their intuition right, which, as Kemp highlights, can become intensely personal for academics, as it feels that your entire career is brought into question if you make the wrong judgement. This is not helped when individuals have vetted interest in the outcomes of their research, whether for financial rewards or international prestige, and individuals can be very stubborn when it comes to being told they are wrong, whether that's the individual academic or the institution of dealers, auction houses and museums. All in all, the art market can become a very stubborn, slow-moving, and dare I say, toxic place to be if you try to change the status quo, as science has begun to do in the past few decades. Speaking of stubborn places, let's move on to Artwatch UK, its aims and director Michael Daly. The organisation Artwatch International was founded by James Beck at Columbia University in 1991 to monitor and campaign for better practices in the conservation of artworks. Although I fully support this vision, as I'm sure I'll cover, because restoration practices in the past have been at a minimum a bit dodgy and at worst corrosive and damaging to some works of art. However, as you will see if you investigate the Artwatch UK website and from hearing Michael Daly's arguments against the Leonardo attribution and Kemp's research, I do not think the organisation, or potentially just Daly in particular, approaches their aims in a constructive or collaborative way. In many ways, as other scholars have said of the organisation, it feels like the opinions of one person, and they can sometimes be unnecessarily personal and scathing, which I don't think is going to get you anywhere with anyone, let alone territorial academics. 
However, as I have now stated my partial bias towards this resource, I will talk through each of Artwatch's UK's articles, the majority written by the head of the branch, Michael Daly, and discuss his concerns with the work. On the 24th of February 2016, Michael Daly wrote his first article on the Labella Prince Pessa authentication research entitled Problems with the Labella Prince Pessa, Part 1, The Look. Daly starts his article making his claim that it is definitely a 20th century forgery or pastiche Leonardo and not an authentic 15th century work, especially not one made by Leonardo. Daly covers the most common arguments against the authentication, the materials being a hybrid mixture never employed by Leonardo, that it has failed to gain a scholarly consensus and is rejected in major art centres, concluding it is, in his opinion, a forgery made by Giannino Marchig. But let's dive a little deeper into his arguments. For the construction of the work, Daly argues that the oak panel that La Bella Prince Pessa is attached to has butterfly keys in the back, which are commonly used to stop splitting in the panel, but apparently there are no splits visible, and Daly describes their existence as restoration overkill. He also takes issue with the subject of the work, as female portraits became highly collectible in the 19th and 20th centuries, leading to the creation of many fakes, and lack of care in their collectability has led to a high probability of misattribution of the artists and subjects of these portraits, which Daly believes has occurred here. For the general aesthetic of the work, Daly argues that it is more similar to a strict early Renaissance profile convention that was taken from coins and medallions, as shown when Daly compares La Bella Principessa to two portraits both entitled A Young Woman. These works, not by Leonardo, look similar. However, in comparison with Leonardo's other works of the supposed time period, she is not in the style that Leonardo worked in. For Daly, this is further highlighted in the way the work is laid out on the canvas, as the bust and the triangular slit in the sleeve run off the canvas, which he feels is not how Leonardo would have spaced it. The anatomical issues, such as the way the shoulder falls and the way the eye is drawn, are seen as further evidence for Dali. Alongside this, he argues that La Bella Principessa is very bland in comparison with most other female portraits of this era, that focus on the fashion as a sign of status, which Dali evidences through a comparison of La Bella Principessa to two portraits. Portrait of Bianca Maria Saforza by Ambrogio di Predes and the portrait of Giovanni Diegli Albizza Tornabone by Domenico Golandio, both made around the same period as La Bella Principessa, but both more concerned with the finery than the face of the sitter. He also compares her to a work of Leonardo's, La Bella Foriena, which was made at a similar time to La Bella Principessa, but is more similar in its focus on the clothing of the sitter. For Dali, this leads him to suggest that La Bella Principessa was not made for this 15th century audience, but for a more modern one, with an eye on the modern photographically informed market. These issues of style are very important for Dali, as La Bella Principessa's inclusion into Leonardo's au revoir would, in his opinion, completely disrupt the flow of Leonardo's legacy in portraiture. In Dali's own words, the female portraits on either side of La Bella Principessa's creation are unprecedentedly complex and sophisticated evocations of real, sculpturally palpable women in tangible spaces or landscapes. This point is further argued by Frank Zollner, a professor of medieval and modern art at the University of Leipzig, Germany, who highlights that the change in portrait style in favour of a three-quarter bust as seen developed by Leonardo and which became a hallmark of Renaissance portraiture occurred over 15 years before La Bella Principessa's supposed creation. For Dali and Zollner, this one-time return to create La Bella Principessa seems improbable and very questionable. Dali continues this by suggesting that the inclusion of any atypical work, whether bona fide or forged, into an overworld would affect its legacy. He also argues that for him to believe it belongs, pro Leonardo scholars must show how and where La Bella Principessa might plausibly have fitted within the trajectory of Leonardo's accepted works, and they must demonstrate by comparative visual means that La Bella Principessa is the artistic equal of the chronologically adjacent works within the oeuvre. Although I understand this sentiment, I personally take issue with these statements, as I think any work that is proven to be by an artist should be added into their oeuvre, regardless of whether it shifts our understanding of the artist or conforms to the pattern we already know. To be an artist is to experiment, and nobody becomes a great artist in every medium or subject matter once they have mastered a subject or a material. If La Bella Principessa is by Leonardo, as it has been mentioned many times before, this would be a new drawing material and a new pairing of materials for him. So I think it is unfair and rather ridiculous to expect that his experimentation with this work is going to be perfect, just because he is regarded as a Renaissance master in the present. Realistically, I would argue that Dali would never accept that it was a Leonardo without a written record of it, which most likely means he will never accept it. Kemp has a few rebuttals to Dali's concerns. Firstly, the anatomical errors in the eye for Kemp highlights that Dali didn't take into consideration that this work is a portrait, not an anatomical drawing, and that damage over time or the restoration efforts could have changed how it looks in the 20th century. From Cott's photography, you can see that the eye is laid in, 
and covered with the upper lid, which according to Kemp is very characteristic for Leonardo as he liked to know the underneath anatomical structure of his works. The anatomical criticism that Dali makes about the shoulder have also happened previously to other Leonardo works, such as his portrait of Isabella de Esther, which is more similar in style to the way portrait busts are sculpted. He also disparages the implication of Gianni Normatric as a forger of this work, which Kemp and Cott both argue isn't possible due to the materials used to construct the work being dated to around the 15th century. In an even more outrageous turn of events, Sean Greenhall, a famous English art forger who managed to forge ancient works in his parents' shed and sell them to the National Museum, took credit for La Bella Principessa, a Leonardo-inspired portrait based on a checkout girl at his local co-op supermarket. Obviously, Kemp doesn't believe this is true and believes that Greenhall is just trying to grab media attention. On the 3rd of May 2016, Michael Daly released a second article on La Bella Principessa entitled Part 2, Authentication Crisis. For Daly, the biggest issue is the Marchigs and their story of provenance for the work. He believes the Marchigs are shady, highlighting that Giannino was in his 50s when he met Jeannie, who was an art student, and that he had good wealth at this point, which others in the art world couldn't account for. Although he worked as a restorer for Berenson and Wildenstein, Daly conspires that maybe he made good money moving Berenson's collections away from the Nazis during World War II. Daly also theorises that La Bella Principessa may have been in Berenson's collection. According to Kenneth Clark, Berenson sat on a pinnacle of corruption as an art historian and authenticator, which could further add to the lack of provenance for the work. Although I have not researched this to confirm, the art market can be very fragile, and it is not surprising that Daly also argues that scholars can be bought for their expertise and opinions, and that the market could be swimming with toxic, unverified assets. Aside from trying to continue his conspiracy that Genie actually sold the work and then rebought it through Silverman, that was mentioned in his first article, and stating that Genie reportedly claimed that Giannino restored La Bella Principessa, which I have not read anywhere else, Dali continues his disagreement with the eye and its incorrect in anatomical design. In his opinion, it appears more cubist in its construction, which he feels Leonardo would not have done, as Leonardo knew how important the anatomical structure was, even if every eye is not drawn to an anatomical exactness. From this, Daly believes that the eye highlights that it's more likely a fake, as copyists and pastiche makers often take parts from works that don't manage to execute them in the same flow as the rest of the work, creating a disjunction between the pieces they are putting together, thus creating a difference between the real and the copy. Daly also feels that the comparisons with the Windsor Profile portrait is too convenient for this work, as although the Windsor Profile and La Bella Principessa were made 15 years apart in different mediums, one in which Leonardo was an expert and one in which he has no documented experience, they have similar proportions, features and pentimenti, which for Daly feels like too many coincidences. I would argue that if this is true, then potentially the Windsor Castle drawing was used as an inspiration for La Bella Principessa, if it is a fake or pastiche. To finish his article, Daly decides to insult Kemp's methodology and connoisseurship, as according to Daly, Kemp despises the class-based connoisseur, does not respond well to criticism, and prefers abuse and denigration to straightforward and healthy critical engagement, as well as arguing that Kemp does not follow traditional connoisseurship, which Daly states Kemp frequently disparages on quasi-scientific, professional, and leftist political grounds. Daly believes that if Kemp did follow traditional connoisseurship practices, then he would be looking to discern differences between authentic and inauthentic objects, rather than looking for similarities, like he believes Kemp does, which exist in abundance between authentic works, copies and forgeries. In Artwatch's third instalment of its La Bella Prince Pessa investigations on the 24th of May 2016, Dali allows Pissarek to respond to Kemp's arguments against her findings. Kemp previously had published a list of 20 chronological arguments against Pissarek's research, which Pissarek replied to in Artwatch. For this section, after Dali's brief introduction, I will go through the key arguments made by Kemp and Pissarek's rebuttal. I would do all 20, but some of these issues follow a similar theme or have a similar resolution, so this should be easier to follow. For Dali, there are two main issues with the Warsaw's aforesaid theory. Firstly, that no one can find any provenance definitively mentioning La Bella Principessa in relation to the Warsaw's aforesaid. And secondly, that Cott's research regarding the stitch holes has too many potentials for error and that he doesn't understand how Cott could have calibrated correctly for multiple potential errors. From his understanding of bookbinding, he doesn't believe that the whole spacing and layout found in La Bella Principessa would have worked with the current book to make a neatly opening book, as well as the fact that there are not enough holes which Kemp and Cott put down to a potential rebinding or damage. 
Now let's move on to Kemp's initial criticisms of Pissarek's research and Pissarek's rebuttals. Kemp's first major argument concerns Pissarek's bibliography, largely arguing that she ignores scientific evidence from Kemp and Cott's joint publications as well as from other sources. He also argues that she relies too heavily on the standpoints of certain writers, such as Julia Cartwright's theories about the identity of the sitter and Horodowski's research on the symbolism of the Sephorsad illuminations that, according to Kemp, have been viewed by academics, in the case of Cartwright, as being well-researched but romantically embroidered, and in the case of Horodowski as being slightly outdated, as new research has possibly changed our understanding of some of the symbolism. Pissarek, however, refutes these claims firstly by bookmarking the references she has used throughout her article, as well as highlighting the alternative she used to collect evidence, which may have been in a limited release or in a different language, and that some works had not been published when she'd submitted her work in 2014. Secondarily, she believes that Kemp's arguments against Cartwright could easily be applied to his own research, as there are only a few academics that believe in the Leonardo theory, which Pissarek believes is not supported by any evidence. She also believes from her research that Horodowski's interpretations are more convincing than others, and that the lack of symbolism for Galeazzo Sansovino in the frontispiece, which she lists, proves to her that the Warsaw Sephorsad was not intended for him and that La Bella Principessa would not belong there if this was the case. Kemp's second major argument concerns the lack of provenance before the Marchigs, and Pissarek's belief that there must be records somewhere for this Leonardo. To Kemp, the lack of records for Leonardo is not uncommon, as the majority of his work is not mentioned in his records, and its potential home in the Warsaw Sephorsad would explain why it would be missing. However, Pissarek argues that there are several works by Leonardo that are mentioned in his notes, although not in any great detail, and that any records of the Warsaw Sephorsad only confirms the book, not that La Bella Principessa was inside. She also believes that if La Bella Principessa had been excised, which is when Kemp believes the slip in the cut on the side might have occurred, this would not be necessary during a rebinding, and if it had been cut out for another purpose, either looted or as a standalone portrait, there is also no record of it entering into a different collection or it being identified as a Leonardo. I personally have an issue with the lack of record argument, as from the research that Wozniak has done, it is clear that if it had been in Poland within these collections, there was a lot of potential for it to be missed due to political and inheritance issues. This is not to say that Pissarek doesn't have an argument here, but that to argue it should be in a record if it was thought to be a Leonardo because it would have been so important doesn't mean it wasn't in a record that we no longer have access to, or that it may have been kept off of records to protect it from looters. Kemp's next group of arguments cover a few different topics that Pissarek and Kemp had alternative interpretations of. Firstly, Kemp denies Pissarek's claims that there was a grand search by pro-Leonardo scholars to find a specific codex, where vellum is most commonly used, for La Bella Principessa's origin, arguing they were looking at a potential lead with the Sephorsad but had not searched every manuscript. Pissarek, however, cites a 2011 Guardian article where Kemp suggested he was embarking on what he describes as a needle in a haystack search for a codex missing a sheet. I think this point can be thrown out as a misinterpretation of journalistic flair and how literally you take this statement. Secondly, Kemp argues that the earlier identification of La Bella Principessa as Bianca Maria Sephorsa predates the research on the Sephorsad, so the earlier identification should be ignored, in favour of the more agreed identification of Bianca Sephorsa. However, Pissarek argues that Kemp hasn't explained why this initial identification was accepted as a possibility when depictions of Bianca Maria look so different from La Bella Principessa. Thirdly, they disagree on the use of the words betrothal and marriage, as according to Kemp, the betrothal of Galeazzo and Bianca happened in 1489 when Bianca was around six years old, and that they married in 1490, but didn't consummate the marriage until 1496 when Bianca moved in with Galeazzo. Pissarek concedes that betrothal is the more appropriate word, but that multiple references say the wedding took place in either 1489 or 1490 to no definitive consensus. The consummation of the marriage theory, if Kemp's timeline is correct, could also explain the modest dressing of the sitter in comparison with other court portraits, as this was a common formality in the Renaissance. Although Pissarek still has issues with the dress that are not answered by Kemp, such as the triangular slit, Kemp believes most of these questions are answered by Elisabetta Granera's work on Renaissance fashion. This book, however, is limited edition, very expensive and hard to track down, so I can understand if Pissarek has not been able to read this work, as neither have I. In discussing the research of the vellum, which ultimately can be resolved in person with both parties having access to the original La Bella Principessa and the Warsaw Sephorsad, they disagree over the size of the vellum sheet, whether the holes match, and if the vellums match. Both argue each other's methodology is flawed. Pissarek argues Kemp and Cott gave too many allowances for the condition of the vellum. Kemp argues that Pissarek has not seen La Bella Principessa firsthand, so has no idea what it is actually like, and only has digital images for comparison. Pissarek also believes that they have miscounted the binding of the book and have placed 
Isabella Bella Prince Pessa facing a written page, again, all of this could be resolved through a collaborative research session with both articles being examined firsthand, but whether this will happen, I don't know. In terms of stylistic content, although Pisserick believes there was an almost total absence of detailed stylistic comparisons with other Leonardo works, Kemp refutes this. However, Pisserick highlights that this statement was made by David Escadian and not by herself, and that although he saw comparisons within the works that he compared with Abella Pinsapessa, Pisserick only saw stark differences. Unsurprisingly, they have differing interpretations of the left-handed hatching, which Kemp believes isn't the only piece of evidence to suggest Leonardo, but that it doesn't take away from the attribution either. But Pisserick argues it either means it is a Leonardo or it's an imitator, as it excludes the rest of his circle who were right-handed. Alongside the left-handed hatching, the use of the fingers and palms to move the paint is viewed by Kemp as a common Leonardoism. Pisserick, however, seems to discuss the fingerprint work by Byro, which has been proven to be largely invalid, continuing her arguments to suggest that the palm prints don't matter either. She also argues that this may have been by mistake, as it was only used once, whereas other notable Leonardo works see the palm used repeatedly. Kemp's final arguments discuss his outrage that Pisserick would implicate the Marchigs as the forgers of this work, with Kemp arguing again that they would both be failed forgers for never claiming the work was a Leonardo and trying to sell it, as well as that most of Cott's research places all the materials in the 15th century which would be almost impossible for a forger to find and use to make an unknown Leonardo and to sell it as such, and would be incredibly pointless work if they never told anyone that it was a Leonardo. Pisserick retorts that she never said they were forgers, although it does feel heavily implied in her research in my opinion, but rather tried to highlight Giannino's background as a Leonardo-esque painter and that he may have had the ability to create a forgery if he had wanted to, but admits that he never claimed La Bella Principessa to be by Leonardo. However, she argues it is strange that there is no provenance before the Marchigs and that Kemp and Silverman's research into a possible link to Bernard Berenson's archives has also not brought further provenance to the table. Kemp also reprimands Pisserick for making damaging allegations about him potentially profiting off of the work by becoming head of a Renaissance Studies Foundation. However, Pisserick argues that this was a direct quotation from an article and that she does not question Kemp's integrity on the work, as she believes in his belief that it is a Leonardo, but that she doesn't believe in his methodology and the research he has gathered to make that attribution. Overall, we can see that these two academics largely do not agree, and that Kemp's research only seems to bring more questions to Pisserick which she can't find a resolute answer to. Whether their opinions would change if they worked together, and if Pisserick was able to see La Bella Principessa and the Warsaw Sforza together, I do not know. Personally, I think a collaborative effort between the two would be interesting, and would provide a more critical debate and potentially allow for Kemp to find evidence needed to persuade anti-Leonardo scholars like Pisserick, or for Pisserick to be able to highlight her issues more effectively to pro-Leonardo scholars if they really wanted to gain a firm attribution. Dali continues his questioning of the work two months later in July of 2016, when he publishes the fourth article discussing Kemp's claims about the Sephorsad. He continues to argue that outside of the Italian academic world, most academics do not believe in Kemp's theories of La Bella Principessa in the Warsaw Sephorsad, calling it methodological juju. Largely, Dali continues to reiterate that La Bella Principessa does not fit into Leonardo's oeuvre, that there is no mention of La Bella Principessa within the Warsaw Sephorsad, and no record of a connection to Warsaw, especially none that has been independently corroborated. He argues that the original three stitch holes found on La Bella Principessa do not fit the stitching in the Sephorsad, that it was too heavy to have been only stitched together with three, and would need the five stitches thought to have been from a later rebinding, which matches the other books, as highlighted by Pisarek. Citing Pisarek again, Dali believes that the colour and texture of the vellum looks different between the two objects, even though to my knowledge, he has only seen pictures of them, and like Pisarek, has never seen them both together. He discusses Pisarek's discussion with the National Library of Warsaw, and their investigation into determining the spacing for the stitch holes, and believes in their conclusion that they do not match. These investigations have suggested that each of these stitch holes should be double holes, so realistically it should be pairs of stitch holes on La Bella Principessa, making it five pairs, or ten holes altogether, in the opinion of Artwatch and the National Library of Warsaw in comparison with Kemp and Cott's three stitch holes. Ultimately, both Pisarek and Dali believe that the stitch holes couldn't have possibly come from the same book and that the Warsaw Sephorsad is not the home of La Bella Principessa. Dali also argues that the testing on the ageing of the materials has never been publicly released, which could leave it to misinterpretation or biased interpretations, as Dali believes that there is a very small probability that all of the timelines required to make this work, such as Bianca Sephorsa being alive and betrothed, Leonardo being in the Sephorsa court and the book being commissioned, would all overlap. Overall, he still believes it isn't part of the Warsaw Sephorsa and remains unconvinced that it is a Leonardo. <laughs> Thank you.
You would think that everything would have gone quiet by 2020, as there hasn't really been any more research of note or more findings released by Kemp and the pro Leonardo side. Not that I have found anyway. However, Dali still has things to say in January of 2020 with a final article discussing the Eye of La Bella Principessa. This article continues to argue that the painting is not anatomically correct and presents a new theory that I do not fully understand, so I will try to briefly summarise, that the technique used to draw the eye looks very similar to the technique shown in a French drawing textbook from the early 20th century, which could be used to evidence that the artwork is a pastiche or forgery by a talented artist. Dali again tries to insinuate that it was created by Giannino Marchig and that he fits the classic forger's profile. So we are at the end of the story for La Bella Principessa. We have learned a lot about the Sforza family, the complicated history of book collections in Poland since the 16th century, and seen what an academic spat looks like. This story doesn't end with a nice finale like some of my other stories will. Giannino is not proved to be a forger of anything, Silverman hasn't made millions selling an innovative Leonardo, and Kemp has not been able to convince the art world that this is irrefutably a work by Leonardo. I personally have no idea whether it is or isn't myself. I've never seen the works, I'm also not an expert in Leonardo and would have no idea if I saw it whether it was or not, but I do have some conclusions. Firstly, if it was a pastiche made by Giannino Marchig, I don't think it was ever meant to be seen as a true Leonardo, and the fact that he has died obviously creates this mystery around him and the work's history, which could have been resolved if he was here to tell his side. Personally, I find it a bit insensitive that people want to argue he has created this forged Leonardo when he is not here to defend himself or say otherwise. If he had made it to be a forgery, he never committed a crime, as it was never sold as a misrepresentation, and I think to characterise him as an artist that was capable of forgery when he has not been evidenced to have committed or convicted of any crimes associated with forgery is rather unfair. Secondly, I think this case is important in the discussion of how academics present and articulate information within the art world, and how media misrepresentations and misunderstandings can cause chaos within scenarios like this. Throughout, I would argue that Kemp has been trying to gather as much evidence as possible to present a case for Leonardo, but that not all pro-Leonardo experts showed the same level of restraint in their enthusiasm for the work. I think many were too early to declare it a definitive Leonardo, and that this ultimately hampered their ability to make a convincing case for it, as too many people had seen the media outcry against different bits of research, such as the shady past of Joseph Biro, or the lack of understanding of the scientific efforts of Pascal Cott, which led to mass misunderstanding and ignoring of his research by some connoisseurs. Finally, I would argue that there is likely to never be a unanimous ending to this work, and that most experts will continue to argue their side. There are academics not mentioned in these videos that have their own opinions and criticisms, but some are not as well evidenced or presented as the ones included. However, if there are any updates on this work, or if it is ever up for sale as a Leonardo, I will of course update on this, but I think this may be where we are at for now.